I welcome you all to this uh, very important session and uh, I would request Sarika to make a beginning. Okay. So, the last session uh, we closed with uh, questions and uh, some ideas on epidemiological databases needed for uh, integration and for modernization and I think that is a good point to start uh, the following session we have on uh, Ayush and epidemiology. Um, sir has uh, put Sir uh, uh, Hill's picture here and I remember his quote from uh, uh, his presidential address to the Royal Society of Medicine in 1965 and what he said uh, seems relevant, more relevant today to me when I think of Ayush and epidemiology. He said, all scientific work is incomplete whether it is observational or experimental. All scientific work is liable to be upset or modifiable with advancing knowledge. It's, we feel it is all the more true and that does not confer upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that it appears to demand at a given time. And I think uh, that is where we are lacking. We have the knowledge, but we see very less action from the knowledge that we already have. And we always uh, demand for more knowledge, but I think there is also a time when we are to put to best use what knowledge we already have. And I hope from this session and the six uh, very experienced speakers that we are very happy to have today with us, uh, with this small group, uh, we will be able to make some move towards driving an action agenda from this conference. I think this conference should not just end with a discussion here, but we should be able to have some points to grow up to some action from this and that I hope uh, this group will contribute to. Uh, with this, uh, I introduce to you the chair of this chairperson of this session, uh, Dr. Mohan Gupte. I think most of you will know him. Uh, he has been the ICMA chair in epidemiology at the National AIDS Research Institute in Pune, a very well known teacher in epidemiology, researcher and a uh, very efficient administrator. He is also the director of National Institute of Epidemiology in Chennai, one of the premier institutes in epidemiology in India as you would know. Uh, he graduated from the prestigious BJ Medical College, where he also did his MD in uh, preventive and social medicine that was way back in 1975. I am right, 1995 I guess. Uh, he has been involved in BCG trials and trials with the leprosy vaccine, but beyond that he has been a very well known teacher and author in epidemiology and I would say an authority in epidemiology in India. Uh, very happy to have you to chair this session sir. Uh, uh, for the plan for the session is that we will have uh, Dr. Gupte give us a brief overview of epidemiology and Ayush and then we will have our speakers. We will have a mix of uh, speakers today, three are from uh, who are clinicians and experts and using epidemiology in clinical practice, three are from the social sciences background who have been using epidemiology and social sciences with regard to Ayush. So, with this mix uh, we will first have one group and the other group and at the end we will conclude uh, with some action agenda if possible. Uh, is that uh, comfortable with everyone I guess? I am hesitant to say good afternoon friends or good morning friends because several of my teachers are here. <coughs> Professor Mutatkar was my teacher. Dr. Vaidya's name I have been hearing, I have been hearing him also sometime or the other. And to say call him friend is, uh, is not possible. In fact, that reminds me of Professor N. K. Bide, late N. K. Bide. He used to stay in Pune, Pune only, close to Lakshmi Road in front of Vishram Bhagwada. I happened to meet him somewhere nearby on the road in the last about five years back. And I have done my ergot poisoning work with him. So I spent quite some time with him, talking to him. And when I met him on the road, my immediate response was, I touched his feet and you would not believe he did the same for me. 
he said i belong to varkari panth so hari hari i am doing it the same way in that way i can say yes we are friends but i know the amount of uh, freedom i need to take with a person of that caliber is perhaps i can never do i have taken one liberty with all of you already i have cancelled t which will take away 15 minutes of hours so i said we are not going to have tea we are not going outside because they can't serve tea here so that is cancelled now we have five speakers i'm told because i don't see rajesh dikshit coming over here and that being so i will take perhaps 5 10 minutes towards the end not in the beginning but you can see here the two photographs <coughs> i put agastya rishi for one simple reason i spent about 25 years in chennai and my link with siddha i can never forget so he is supposed to be the father figure for siddha and then of course for modern medicine randomized control trials we can never forget bradford hill sarika quoted what bradford hill said for one occasion when it comes to rct randomized control trial <coughs> his comment towards the end if you say rct is the only way you can prove something it's not only the pendulum has come out of the socket it, it has not only gone to the other side of the uh, movement it has come out it can't be more relevant than that statement for our meeting today when it comes to epidemiology and when it comes to ayurveda today or ayush today most of you and most of us think that what ayush is doing is essentially clinical epidemiology and not the classical epidemiology the way we see whether we like or not that seems to be the truth so we may perhaps build on what we are already having in terms of clinical epidemiology but without forgetting that we need to go to classical epidemiology also at some stage now with these few beginning points or beginning remarks i would perhaps go to dr arvind chopra straight away and request him to talk to us about community based studies we left the morning debate the crying need for epidemiology uh i must uh, submit right at the outset that uh i'm not going to be talking about therapeutics but i've been asked to talk about my own uh work within the community uh and hopefully by the end of my the talk i will bring forth some my own personal views on what i think can be the link or the contribution of ayurveda and epidemiology so bear with me that the first uh, few minutes are not going to be about ayurveda but about the epidemiology as a tool where you work in the community and uh, primarily you learn about what the community <coughs> believes thinks practices and what the community wants i think that's very important so uh, uh, i had this great opportunity after my specialization training in rheumatology to come back to india and to be asked to launch a who program called copcord uh, it's really in a in a an ngo domain and uh, the reason why this program was launched was that it was felt that while there's plenty of data on pain and disability and arthritis in the west we don't have such data in the developing economies we all know that musculoskeletal pain is extremely important but where is the data that was a need and uh, at this point in time there are several countries which are doing the uh, copcord programs in fact the more than 27 countries and uh, i am just fortunate enough to be the international coordinator for this program since 2005 but today i'm going to confine myself to what we have done in india and uh, the several references which you can track down on the on the net on copcord well my story begins in village bhigwan uh, many of you would know where B village bhigwan is it's about 100 kilometers from pune and it's on the world map for migration of birds but i'm not going to talk about flamingos which you've got to see to believe what 
happens to begin when all these beautiful word, words come there. Can I request you all to sit this side? I need to look after my neck also. And I think uh, if some of you are postgraduates, you ought to be there because my uh, aim today is to really talk about very basic clinical epidemiology for the postgraduates, especially the Ayurvedic physicians who are sitting here who may like to take on this work. So uh, I chose this village, actually, honestly, I chose this village without knowing uh, that this will become my life passion. I'm a rheumatologist, I'm a clinician, sir, and my only uh, aim in epidemiology was to pass my MBBS, where they teach you very little epidemiology, which is absolutely, uh, you know, they don't tell you that this is going to be the foundation of your clinical work later on. It's such a neglected field. But my learnings of epidemiology actually took place in this village. As I went along, I learned what epidemics are all about. And, a lot, and my mindset changed. Why I chose this village, big one? Uh, I really, after my army career, my first intention was, let me know something about Maharashtra, about villages, about the culture, because I got unfortunately married to a Pune girl, so I knew I would spend my life in Pune. I might as well know about Maharashtra before, <laughs> before I do my practice and everything else. So this program was launched in Village Big One, uh, primarily because one of the doctors out there in that village who just happened to become my patient by chance told me, doctor, you want villages come to Big One, and I've had no regrets. Uh, when in epidemiology, it's very important to look at what area you choose. It should be geographically well-defined. Uh, there should be reasons why you want to. The excess should be there. It should not be di diluted by migrations, depending on your research question. And I thought everything was there. It used, it used to take me three and a half to four hours to reach Village Big One in 1996. Today, you can reach in 55 minutes. So that, that's a story. It was really a village. Now, uh, I'm going to just go through my slides. I'm going to read them. I'm going to just put some uh, concepts across to people who are going to be brave enough to do epidemiology in their careers. Believe me, it's, uh, you have to be very brave. To do epidemiology, I personally believe you have to become one amongst the community where you're going to work. You've got to know about the territory very well. You've got to win the hearts and minds of people. That doesn't happen just because you're a brilliant rheumatologist or you know everything about rheumatology. So either you can do that or you can't do it. And I'm going to talk about clinical epidemiology more than anything else. So yes, I knew about that. And my army training came into a great use. And here's all these people, young people are sitting with these t-shirts, were my volunteers to start with. They were trained what I'm seeking for, the burden of disease in this village. And I made them feel very important, as you can see this. Only big one in the whole map of India, nothing else. That's important. Believe me, I've gone across the world to see many programs I'm not saying that, I personally am very critical about most epidemiological surveys that have taken place in India and even abroad. But that's different, forget about the abroad. We are a different situation. And let me put my first comment. I was taught by the WHO to do this program to gather data on pain and disability. Simple, go to the village, get enumerators, work house to house, pick up data. I realized that would be very foolish. That's my primary objective. These people don't need that. They don't care a damn. I need to serve them. I need to out. I need to find how I'm going to look after the arthritis, rheumatism. That's where the clinician in me got better of my so-called training in epidemiology. So I want to put this idea forth that at least in our part of the world, epidemiological surveys are best when you give something back to the community. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes, what we finally achieved. And, and this was just a one-year program. The mandate was Dr. Chopra, go and work as well one year, get the first maiden data on musculoskeletal disorders in India, and be part of the world. Today is 19 years, and I can't leave this village. And, and, I, and this is what happens when you, when I think this is the kind of epidemiology which I would love to share with you and inspire you to do it. Now, this is a classical model. This is important for those of you who would like to work in the community, that you know the community, there are various stages. That's not important. It's, but the important thing is that first you need to house to house, collect as much data as possible from the population. That's your denominator. Throw the net. I'm interested in musculoskeletal disorders, but I also need to know how many are suffering from diabetes, how many are hypertensives, how many this, how many that, how many tobacco, how much alcohol. So you gather a lot of data to start with, whether you think it's useful to your project or not. And that was the phase one. And then because I'm a rheumatologist, I went around a lot of comprehensive data to collect on symptoms, disability, quality of life, and finally my own rheumatology evaluation. And there are other stages which are important, which define the entire doctrine. It and all these are important. But what we did in Big One was, what I showed you in the earlier slide is a conventional way of doing epidemiology. Do this, do that, do that. 
and surveys do not get over, they take donkey years sometimes. The budgets run out, you do not get extension and many, many surveys fail and I was aware of that. Secondly, if you are doing a survey based on a clinical problem like I was doing, arthritis, rheumatism, I will not be able to catch all the acute conditions if I take all the time in the world to complete the survey. So we devised what became later on a very, very popular in rheumatology at least. You can, if you go to the net, uh, uh, we devised a model called Big One Fast Track Model, where we said no. When the first part of our sort of volunteers went into the house to house to collect the phase one, after three days, I told my nurses and my registrars to start the phase two symptoms record. Another three days, I said, I'm going to be there in the village looking at your first sort of patients. So we worked in parallel and we changed the entire model of WHO upside down and that became the big one, Copcot model which many countries in the world have adopted. You can understand great saving in time and money, but it needs a lot of trading for that. And I think that's very important in parallel. So, and the other, the, this is the only project in the world, Copcot project in the world, the big one, where from day one we announced in the village, we are going to treat you. We are going to give free of cost treatment, investigations, everything free of cost. And that's how we won their cooperation. That's why till today those, the village doesn't want me to leave. So I think these small things are very important. The screening questionnaire, every survey has to have a screening questionnaire. You've got to have a primary objective. But believe me, as you go along in epidemiological survey, there are many, many secondary objectives and many more things that you learn. So to save time, uh, you're welcome to come to my center and see this entire program, questions, et cetera. I don't have time to go into details. Uh, how, what all we captured. Everything was not rheumatological, but what I want to tell you is your question should be worked out very diligently. You should really, uh, I was lucky that not only as a clinician, but I had my epidemiology friends, I have biostatisticians with me, and several of the people who, who we sat down, we spent about six weeks to first plan the study. It's other than the literature review. So you've got to know what you're going to do. So let's forget about all these questionnaires which are there, if any of you want to really know. But this is important for those of you who are going to work in the Ayush. Why am I here talking today? Let me tell you. Just about six weeks back, I got myself associated with the All India Institute of Ayurveda in Delhi, went there. Tanuja is not here, she invited me there. And yes, I became part of the epidemiology because I like it so much. I said, okay, if you want me to drive epidemiology in Ayush in the field, I'd love to do it. I'll come end up. Uh, so we, I'm very much part of that now. But my role is not going to be the Ayurvedic component for which I'm not trained, but I'm going to be looking at the grassroot level brass tags, tools. That's where I can possibly contribute as to what is required for an effective clinical epidemiological program. So 7,000 people surveyed, sir, in five weeks' time, all phase over. This itself made many people think that we have done a fraud in the field of rheumatoid epidemiology. Lots of people came to the world to actually check this. And that's when we unraveled that it's possible. Everything can be done. And, and, and then, of course, the usual things came out you got to have comparisons. There's only one village is not India. All those things are for another day. We got a lot of data. Let's forget about that. Let me talk about something to be relevant to you. Right outside Big One, as you enter Big One, if you've gone, there's a very famous Ayurveda ashram run by a very nice group of people for several years. And when I used to go, I used to see a line of trucks and buses and everyone pouring into this ashram. And, and gradually, I found out that this ashram is very famous for treatment for diabetes and for arthritis. When I looked at my data in the village, and when I looked at the treatment resources which I had captured, not more than, have I got that? Yeah, less than 10% were recorded in my data, people from this village had ever been to either Ayurveda or Hombeti. That was my first learning. There's so many things I've learned. I thought something gone wrong. I met the doctors. The majority of the doctors were from BMS, as you can see. I went to the community. I did a little bit of a random check here and there, and then I learned from the community. They said, who has the time? to take Ayurvedic medicines and get better. Dr. Mala, ek ratri madhe bar paiche, udhya mala cheta madhe kaam karna. First learning. You understood? Sorry, sir, they wanted quick relief. Okay, so I thought that just this is an important point and, and several things. And then they told me that he is the most important man in the village. He is your competition. He charged me 20 rupees for taking this photograph. But he said, you are going to compete with him. I made friends with him because my objective was to gather data and serve. Quackery didn't bother me at all. In fact, some of my own doctors said, doctor, how can you have this doctor and that doctor attending your 
CMB program, I said it does not make matter. He treat, oh, he or she, sorry, he or she treats the patient, that is important to me. The eye may can look after the rest of the stuff, I am not interested in that. If he or she is a doctor in this village, I need to know it. And that is how we went along the program. So, so I have got 15 minutes, right? Okay. So, and there are a lot of things which we learnt about some of the factors, some of the risk factors from the village when you work close to a community. I want to only say that just trauma was very, very important because of the condition under which we live and work. But I learned two things. Habits and traditions are great risk factors in the kind of data that I was picking up, musculoskeletal disorders. Go to the field, Rana Madhya Janar, no toilets in 1996. I think I started my toilet movement sir, before the government started. And I realized that women, they are the sufferers. A woman has arthritis and that too in the knee. Can you imagine? I tell her to take all the medicine, methotrex, etc., etc., et all my killers, painkillers, and I tell her drink lots of water. How do you manage it? These are some of the community things that you learn there which you cannot learn in hospitals anywhere else. And the second thing which I realized was, so the knee was suffering all the time because the mother-in-law said, "Tu khali bas, te sabai chutnari paide." If you don't sit down, you lose the habit. An inflamed knee joint will get totally damaged and destroyed if you keep sitting on the floor. So you can't apply everything to everywhere. I agree that yoga is very good, but you can't stretch inflamed joints. Now these things you have to know, and you learn them from your patients. And the second thing which I learned so was the tobacco use, rampant. Misery. Men used, I was not surprised. Women used, I was so surprised. Then I learned why they use it, because they work in the fields. I, these are my statistics published, presented many times, and I have validated it all over India actually. Why they were using tobacco, I do not have to go into details. But I failed miserably in containing this problem, because tobacco is one of the most important risk factors for premature atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, osteoporosis, premature deaths, not in rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, you name autoimmune disorders. But I could not convince this village. All these years later, they still, why did I fail? I am going to tell about that also. So let us forget about this. What did I gain in this village, which I think may be useful to you all? Some of you are going to do this. First is awareness. Much can be done. Doctor, kai kuch nahi ho, toh maja sande dukh, toh kai kuch nahi honar. Kasha nahi honar. So you tell the community what you can do. You have to demonstrate success. Sir, pardon me, sir, a lot of things in the morning, I did not agree with them, but I kept quiet. Uh, you got to demonstrate success. You cannot succeed in life without competition. There is no place for arrogance, I agree there. But humility does not mean that you just sit and do nothing. And here is my guru, he will tell you all about it. You have humility is fine, you learn from him. But you have to be competitive. You cannot tell Ayurveda, that is nonsense. You will never go ahead. And that is what I remind me that there I was there to uh, compete with my daughter. A lot can be done. And the, one of the reasons why we got successful was that my team passion, my team clinical approach. When rheumatoid started walking and leading good life and went to villages, they knew that rheumatoid arthritis is incurable but can be controlled, can be treated. And they are my best ambassadors. And to the whole Maharashtra, I am surprised sometimes people from Bombay come, sir, to big one thinking that I am going to perform some miracle. It is not so. So you go to educate community, medical fraternity, as you do clinical epidemiology, quality of life. Sorry, I, I, uh, okay, I missed a point. Why I failed miserably in tobacco is also I must have some success. The sales have gone up, so I keep a track of that. One question from the community, doctor, do you have an option? We talk about textbooks. Mala sangatta chaple sold on misery. Kya karun? Ratri ghara cha kaam sa kali khita mal janar khurpe sa diye karnar wo karnar all that. Have you got any option? Mai ka bolu daru piyo. That I can't tell. We don't have options. We have no business to educate our community. We need we need to have options. This is traditional. I learned about tobacco, but the other thing also is very interesting. Nineteen years, sir, in working the village, I have not seen a single case of oral cancer. And I tell Dr. Kopikar, what you say, revise your statistics. I agree it's bad. Please don't quote me. I am a, I am a modern man. I know modern scientists that tobacco is bad. But look at the community. In 7,000 people into 19 years, life years, so far I have not seen oral cancer. And I may be missing one or two, but I have got such a good grip on this village with all the doctors attending. I doubt whether I could have missed much, sir. I have seen some other cancers. But I am coming to the point, then why should Dr. Chopra act like a bishop and say, stop tobacco? 
when misery is so useful. Misery law to sakali port ato. So these are things which you must remember. We are long term follow up. All epidemiology programs must have a long term follow up. They should be meaningful. You must educate the people. Let's forget about this. Not and that big one model made us go all over India. So I don't have time for that. A huge program has taken place outside the government domain. We got data which is published now. We know the burden of disease. Rheumatoid arthritis only 0.34 percent prevalence. Everyone just says one percent. So what? You know what is 0.34 percent today? Six to seven million patients. Staggering figures. So don't worry about this 0.34 and all that. This is important. We have urban rural differences. One more thing which the village taught me, sir, which I found it valid, which I validated so all over India. This work was the big one was adopted by the WHO for their bone, uh, for their burden of disease in 2000. They brought up uh, TRS on that. I didn't realize that the maximum number of young women with rheumatoid arthritis are in this data. That made me think so much. And all my studies over India, plus a huge database which I've got now, which I've recently presented, an RA database, to me it has begun to appear that the maximum number of young women with rheumatoid arthritis are from India. And I made that noise so much now, and now there's data to show it, etc. Why it is, we won't talk about, because I know rheumatoid arthritis is, is a perimenopausal problem. But can you imagine the dilemma, a young woman suffering from rheumatoid, all these things you gather as you go along. Last few minutes, sir, Ayurveda and, and, and what I want to say. Please read this paper. Because of this lecture, I went through the net and I tried to find out if any Ayurvedic doctor or anybody has published work. I think I like this work. This is published just last year. Very nice work. Telling us, Ayurveda need not be the domain of modern medicine. Oh, sorry, the, uh, the epidemiology need not be the domain of, uh, epidemiology is a science which anybody can apply wherever you want to use it. So coming to the point, the epidemiological theory, applications, tools, methods, all that are well suited for Ayurveda also, or anything as a matter of fact. Because Ayurveda doesn't describe epidemiology as a chapter. Ayurveda doesn't describe many things. But many of the concepts of epidemiology are there in Ayurveda, which I read a couple. Of, so, so please have a look at this paper. I think this will help you. But what I like most in this paper, and which during the Nimitri days we used to talk about Today, clinicians like me all over the world, we would like to recognize preclinical stages, pre preclinical stages, pre pathogenic stages. RA, actually everywhere, sir, and hypertension, diabetes. Coming to the point, I just want to give the message: Ayurveda can do that, and that can be done through epidemiological studies like the studies that I've shown you. I think, yeah, I can better hurry up now. So I, like I said, these strategies have to be done by Ayush, and I'm going to be, I'll try to uh, promote them. And this is a very nice conference proceedings which were published uh, in, in uh, uh, evidence-based complement in medicine. I think some of you were there. Uh, I picked up what my dear friend Bhushan said in that conference. I was not there, but it's published. And this is 2010. It's so true. Read it. This is what Ayurveda can also do through epidemiology. I, Bhushan and Grish and, uh, and uh, uh, several colleagues, and uh, uh, Sir is here, Dr. Vedde is here. I've been hearing a lot about our genomics and the genetic basis of Prakriti and things like that. And so you made a request in the morning that where is the Prakriti analysis in population and epidemic? This is where you'll get it. Do well defined studies. And this is what I'm going to do in Ayush that you can do this. And I think this is a great statement. This is what you should be talking. The prognosis, diagnosis, and therapeutics in Ayurveda are Prakriti specific. So where's the question of acute, chronic, this, that? So if you can put evidence behind it, you have, you have done it what you want to. The other thing is, sir, this is epidemiology, what we learned in MBBS. Distribution of illness and disease, determinants of health, illness and disease. Lots have written, sir, from modern medicine perspective. Let the Ayurveda write these chapters, sir, from their perspective now. And what I want to add, sir, and I'm glad, sir, I'm, you are here is, why don't we think of adding delivery of health care to epidemiology? Because as I said in the beginning, that's important. So let's forget about this. I think this should be my last slide. Uh, and we are, and you're going to, if I continue to be associated with all in of, of Ayurveda, I'm sure we'll have lots of data coming out. My summary points, because I was told by Greece that some of you may do these studies, that as I've said, if you want to plan a survey, planning is more important than actually execution. Be very clear. And uh, the, the, the line out here, I want you to understand, plan like a military operation. Only then you will succeed. 
and you should know how to lead. And uh, there are many questions. These are some of the basic things. That is the secret of your success. I don't. <laughs> maybe. Well, maybe. I mean, I think I had a very great team, sir. That's the secret of success of this program. I think we need a very good team. And. Uh, and, and remember to exploit local infrastructure sources. Don't go into epidemiological service for this, just going there and coming out. That will never be success. Whatever you do, whatever little you do, but be with the community to get the maximum data, maximum compliance. Then only the yield is great. And uh, provide service to the community. Yes, this is very important. Those of you who will not mind dirtying your hands can only work in the community. This is from epidemiology text. The mind should be clean. But don't get worried if you have to dirt your hands. And uh, like I always say, I tell my registrars, or anyone who does women training with me has to know about the COPCOT program and work in the village. It's mandatory. So only the brave and the daring will go to the fourth into the field and sweat out in the community. If you're ready to do that, then epidemiology is part of your specialization. You need a big team, friends. You need funds also. You need, uh, you need to very pl carefully plan your funds. Not, don't run out of funds. And I dedicate this talk to one man. Late Dr. Tandle, who died just uh, about, I think, a month back. He was associated with me from day one. He's the one who took me to the village Big One. He retired from primary health center in village Big One and stayed there for about 24 years till he died. This man never missed a single visit of mine to the village. He was licensed medical practitioner. His son is a BMS now. Why I'm put, I want to put a message across this. For any epidemiological survey to succeed, you need to have some grassroots people like him, giants like him, who will stand by your side. Because we who are working in air condition, in my practice out here, in Pune, etc., etc., we are very far away from communities, actually. This is the, he is the one who keeps you tagged to the community. He is the one who taught me so much. No patient from outside Big One could ever tell a lie. And nobody in Big One could tell a lie, because he had at least seen three generations. He would say, Tumcha Mulga, Tumcha Vadil, Tumcha Jovamala Maitami delivery Kelly Otatwala. Because that data is very important. We never said no to anyone from Maharashtra coming to the program, but we wanted to make sure that our denominator, big one, remains denominator. So thank you very much, sir. I think this is my last slide. And that's how I look sometimes in big one when I work, not anymore now. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. So I invite uh, Dr. Unni Krishna. He is, has a PhD in international development. He is an Ayurveda graduate, but also has done a lot of work in development and in medical anthropology. He is a trained medical anthropologist. Uh, he is a, a visiting professor at the Tazi uh, Supreme University of, in, uh, in Bangalore. And he is also a <coughs> fellow and postdoctoral fellow for research in international development. Uh, over to Dr. Umni Krishnan for his talk on social science approaches and Ayurveda. Yeah, thank you. Good morning to all. Um, I think uh, when Girish asked me to uh, present my observations on social science, uh, sociology of health and medicine, I thought I will make a very generic presentation on the on the diversity of disciplines that Ayush is covering uh, today, uh, from medical anthropology to medical sociology to health system studies to demography and so on. But when I came here, I thought maybe not very relevant to give such a generic presentation, but I will just switch over to another work that I have done uh, in my research in the past. Uh, so I think the, the reason why I was involved in this uh, uh, session was uh, in the National Symposium last year, we had a, a working group on social sciences and uh, public health. And uh, we wanted to formalize that and also wanted to um, uh, have a special journal issue of JIM uh, dedicated on uh, social science research programs on um, Ayush. Uh, so uh, in that light, I made this overview presentation, but I would uh, rather stick to uh, another kind of experience that I've had during my doctoral studies and so on. Um, so we have, uh, I mean, after the last years that uh, working group on uh, social science and Ayush, we have two formations today. Uh, one is a medical pluralism group. Uh, both are from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, so the medical pluralism group is looking at more epistemological and theoretical dimensions of uh, 
um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary research. The another one is Professor Rutupriya is uh, leading a health system uh, group, which is m looking at more health system uh, studies and so on. And uh, very happy that uh, there is a national network of uh, epidemiology which is forming uh, here uh, through this process. So what I would like to share is uh, uh, a past study that I have done on uh, good health at low cost in uh, in in Kerala. Uh, uh, so if you if you look at the uh, literature on good health at low cost. Uh, there was a Rockefeller Foundation study in 1985, which uh, by Halstead, Walsh, and Warren, uh, uh, which talked about good health at uh, low cost, involving uh, four locations. One was Kerala, the other one was China, then Costa Rica, and Sri Lanka. Basically, looking at how uh, intersectoral dimensions have contributed to good health at low cost. Then in 2011, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine did something very interesting um, uh, called Good Health at Low Cost, uh, 25 years on, what makes a successful health system. And they included uh, uh, another set of countries, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan, Thailand, Tamil Nadu. And it was a review of Rockefeller Foundation study after 25 years. So instead of Kerala, they took uh, 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 Tamil Nadu as a good health system model. There were other studies of similar nature. Uh, there was a 1984 study by Godfrey Gunatil again. It was, it was a WHO supported study which uh, talked about intersectoral linkages to health and development. And that case study also uh, consisted of Kerala, Jamaica, Norway, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. And uh, uh, it was published by uh, the World Health Organization, Geneva. And uh, subsequently, in 1986, uh, by uh, Caldwell, did a study on routes to low mortality in poor countries. And they compared uh, Sri Lanka, Costa Rica, and Kerala. Uh, then in a uh, famous study of uh, Professor Amartya Sen, uh, development as freedom, uh, again, uh, China, Kerala, Sri Lanka, Costa Rica, Jamaica uh, are included. So the, the, uh, it's a very interesting. Uh, picture. I mean, when when Kerala was uh, having uh, uh, nearly uh, 175 dollar uh, uh, per capita income, uh, it was almost performing um, uh, at par with some of the developed countries. And when Professor Kane Raj uh, brought this into a UN uh, meeting, uh, as uh, he did not use the term Kerala model or anything, but he uh, he 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 uh, brought this into uh, to, to a very active discussion which uh, formed the idea of Kerala model of development as a health system. Now it has so many other challenges, uh, but it was uh, uh, highly praised in uh, 1990s and uh, early up to early 2000. And if you look at the Kerala health system literature, you can see um, uh, from 1976 a large uh, um, number of literature uh, by Krishnan et al., Radcliffe, Panikar and Soman, Nag, uh, all in 1970s, and subsequently by Professor Tarakan, Kannan et al. in 1990s, Soman uh, publication on nutrition health development, um, Kumar uh, et al. in 1993, and it goes up to uh, 2010. The last study was morbidity patterns in Kerala level of determinants, uh, etc. And um, Delambadi Narayana did good work. But uh, the, the, the reason for my uh, study uh, of health system model in Kerala was to look at why none of these studies have included Ayurveda as a key uh, determinant or a driver for health system in Kerala. So if you look at uh, the entire literature of, I have, uh, I mean, uh, 50 to 60 kind of sources, uh, studies on Kerala and health system. Dina Balabanova mentions in passing about Ayurveda. Uh, similarly, the Rockefeller Foundation study also mentions in passing. Intersectoral linkages by Godfrey Gunatilke is more interesting. I wish I could uh, show, but I was not prepared for that presentation today. Godfrey Gunatilke says that uh, yoga and Ayurveda has played a significant role in health system development in Kerala. And uh, this is very, very interesting. And he talks about uh, intersectorality, not, not just uh, the biological means of health, but uh, really looking at agriculture, 
social determinants of health and so on. So if you look at the literature, it talks about high developed uh, healthcare infrastructure, access and affordability, which is uh, definitely good in Kerala, increased health awareness, and among, I mean, the hygienic practices, all these are uh, 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 told, decentralization of health services. Uh, public distribution system has been praised, high literacy and education, land reforms, gender equity, labor movements, and all that uh, comes from the social science side, but none talk about Ayurveda. Role of uh, global health, I mean, Ayurveda and Siddha or the Marma tradition, all these are completely left out. And what, uh, there, are, there are some studies by sociologists on health system development in Kerala, by uh, um, Lena Abraham in 1989, which talks about it. Uh, Professor Panikar uh, in 1994 talks about cultural hegemony of Ayurveda in Kerala, where again uh, uh, this is coming. Shankar in 2000s now. And so, sure, yeah. So uh, uh, I was looking at uh, uh, how how the health system has evolved uh, uh, in in last hundred years in uh, Kerala from uh, uh, 1900 when Ayurveda Shala was instituted. So there is a part of social history. Then I was also looking at my study, the, the, the preventive uh, healthcare practices, just for instance, the medical drinking water culture of Kerala, and the, the uh, few, the Panchagarma practices, the reproductive healthcare practices, the, um, those kinds of, around six practices I have uh, looked at in detail, and how they have impacted in Kerala. But what I real and uh, looking at homestead gardens in Kerala. If you look at uh, every homestead, there is nearly, uh, on an average, there is 35 to 150 medicinal plants which are available. So the medicinal plants are easily accessible and available. So uh, the, uh, and this is very significant. These are, these consist of medicinal and nutritional species and um, a lot of health cost saving on account of this has been reported by Professor Kumar and uh, or so uh, these uh, six things which I am not able to show you today but uh, uh, what I have realized is that when you're looking at an integrative uh, integrated healthy lifestyle in a, an entire population I think you need to have different disciplines of social sciences approaching the same problem so it's not just I mean it's not not even just social epidemiology, but it is about social history to medical anthropology to, I mean, uh, sociology, public health, and so on. And uh, of course, the health system studies. So uh, I think I should, uh, my, my learning was, if you have to look at these, uh, I mean, health and place is becoming a very big uh, agenda today, and uh, health and geography. And uh, we have these new perspectives like One Health, Planetary Health, which is uh, radically uh, changing the 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 the, uh, the the understanding of global health. Uh, so uh, I want to just conclude uh, by saying that I think um, we need to uh, go into uh, much diverse disciplines of sociology of health and medicine, especially if you are to look at this public health contribution of higher sector. I'm sorry I couldn't show you the slide because I came for a different presentation. So thank you. And the other thing that we saw was, when it comes to the magic of health in Kerala, we talk of women education, literacy in women and education in women. We don't talk much of Ayurveda in various studies which have been published. So I was hoping that we'll be throwing some light on those issues. If you want to make some comments on those factors, it will be welcome. Thank you for that. Um, I was a bit uh, jittered because of that thing. But I, uh, every every uh, panchayat in Kerala, I like, oh, uh, yeah, 1,030 panchayats. And almost every panchayat has a uh, primary health center of Ayurveda. And if you look at there are around, um, and uh, these are active practices, uh, not just providing primary care, because the, the doctors who are there are also trained for detailed uh, panchakarma kind of treatments and uh, maybe uh, to some extent uh, tertiary and I mean uh, secondary and tertiary care and I think there is a thinning of line in the uh, um, of what is really uh, tertiary or what is primary when it comes to the understanding of Ayush because uh, you, you take care of a very uh, chronic condition which is to be managed in a tertiary care in this kind of a primary 
health care setting. And if you look at the industry presence. Uh, no, no, so, True. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, that's also very uh, uh, because the reproductive health care practices is a very strong component, and uh, there is the the, the prenatal care is uh, quite strong, and there are uh, set protocols which are followed, including uh, like uh, a set of Ayurvedic medicines which are routinely followed by the 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 households for uh, health care. So I think. Uh, it is changing, it is slowly changing, because as you said, uh, there is a lot of new oil use that is happening. And uh, there are uh, new studies on the dietary patterns, especially in the Calicut district and the northern district, where there is a substantial change in the, the dietary pattern. And there is a paper by Carolyn, uh, which in 2011, I think, which talks about this, uh, the, the, this dietary change and its impact on uh, NCDs in the new uh, yeah. Yeah. But there is also yeah, there's also a politics of health uh, playing out there because if you look at the, the historical development, it was called indigenous medicine. And there was no, I mean, there was no difference between the 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 formal. Uh, it is uh, in Malayalam, it was called Natu Chikitsa Vagupa, which actually included the folk practices to the highly codified system. But by 1970s, all of us know from indigenous medicine, it becomes Indian systems of medicine. Then now it's Ayush, and there is complete marginalization of these household practices, and even even the the land, uh, everything has changed. The 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 pattern of living itself has completely changed. So now uh, what was happening in health development in the 80s and 90s when the uh, per capita income uh, was so low is completely changed when Kerala is now a uh, uh, industry friendly or uh, what is a investment friendly uh, place where the, the demography is completely changed. Expenditure state yeah. and today, and beside, yeah. despite the Ayurveda and the folk practices. That and morbidity reporting is very high in Kerala. There are several studies that made that the morbidity reporting which is. That's why Amartya Sen says that that doesn't mean that people are not healthy in other places. It's yeah. just that you're counting them more yeah. or they're able to report more. That's a different issue. So, thank you for bringing in that uh, point about Kerala and Ayurveda, which is so dear to people who want to hear about Ayurveda from Kerala. Uh, we move on to the next uh, speaker. We have with us Dr. Ritu Priya. Uh, she is a professor uh, in the uh, at the Center for Social Medicine and Community Health at Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU Delhi. Uh, she has worked a lot in epidemiology, health systems research, and policy and planning on uh, women's health issues. Uh, she is, has been uh, representing on several task forces for the government, and uh, she is also the coordinator for the transdisciplinary a research cluster on health at JNU, um, which is a very different initiative that I heard of. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Ritupriya. My thanks to Girish Tiluji and to the center here for having me here, because it's been a really exciting two days already, and I'm looking forward to the rest of today and maybe part of tomorrow. Uh, I work on health systems research, and the great angst that I've had, which um, uh, Uni just put across in terms of Kerala not looking at that dimension at all. While it looks at Kerala as one of the models and the Kerala model being uh, you know, highlighted in health systems research, is this fact that now today when we are talking of universal health coverage globally with sustainable development goals, we seem to have one stream which is resurgence and re, you know, uh, revitalization of traditional medicine across the globe, et cetera, et cetera. On the other side, you have universal health coverage coming up, and the two don't talk to each other. They are in complete different silos, including in WHO. So we have a, health policy, a, a traditional health policy from WHO every five years, and we have universal health coverage, but the universal health coverage conferences where we put in uh, you know, proposals for sessions on traditional medicine is not accepted. I made a presentation in the... Uh, 
in Bangladesh, we had a regional conference by the alliance and WHO on universal health coverage and one arguing based on the data in the study that part of it I will talk about here um, across 18 states of India, uh, arguing for the fact that universal health coverage must include traditional medicine uh, wherever across the world, but certainly in South Asia. And uh, while there was a lot of acceptance and you know uh, interaction across the audience, the group organizing that conference was completely uncomfortable and didn't know what to do with me. So uh, you know there is this very clear divide between the two, and it's trying to bridge this is what our effort really is, and that's where I look to the group here to furthering that. Uh, now, why health systems research? And I'm putting this in this format here. I'm beginning a little with an introduction of health systems research, taking that many of the young people here may not have uh, heard about it enough. So we've already heard enough about basic biology, human health and disease, the various studies that we've been doing. Our panels have largely been about that. And so I won't go into that at all, including the laboratory and clinical research. We've heard about epidemiology already. And uh, the kind of epidemiology that he spoke about is really making the bridge between epidemiology and health systems research. Uh, and then we have social, cultural, and psychological dimensions of health being studied by anthropologists, by psychologists, by sociologists. We have health technology assessment, which has become a big area today, uh, because there is an attempt to largely see it in terms of cost effectiveness analysis of technologies, how much benefit versus how much impact and the cost of it, because cost is becoming exorbitant for everyone, including the US and Europe across for healthcare. So therefore, health systems research is now coming into its own in a sense, and what it does is puts to, tries to make sense of all of the previous studies together. How do you bring benefit of all that biological knowledge, knowledge technology, the social knowledge that goes with health into a systemic frame so that policy and programs can actually deliver the maximum benefit to the maximum number of people with manageable cost. That's the mandate of health systems research. And therefore, I think it's extremely important for Ayush people also to get into this research and make their place. And also, as I will uh, show clearly by the end, the fact that we need that epistemological difference of perspectives. What is health systems research? It focuses on design of health service delivery systems and their various inputs. So it's basically looking at technology, the human dimension of human resources of health, as well as the human beings who are going to use it, and the organizational structure that is needed to take that across. Now this is, it seems like three simple areas, but they're not three simple areas. Each one is an area in itself and has its own complete search area, and therefore the complexity of how to bring it all together moving from prevention to rehabilitation, all the kind of inputs that we want. So the components are public health, management research, and policy studies. And to my mind, unfortunately, it's largely been taken over in today's time by the management and economists. And therefore, the sociological, anthropological kind of insights that are required and the public health insights are really being marginalized. And therefore, we'll see, we see part of the consequences of that in this two streams being apart. Uh, but what is it that health system research is about? Again, to continue with sort of introducing that, systems analysis is the first thing we would do, which is to say, describe what is the system like, what are the various dimensions of the system in all the complexity that is available. Therefore, from <coughs> the, if you do it in the official way and you're looking at the public system, then you'd look at from sub-center up to the medical college and tertiary hospitals and what do they mean? Do you want to look at the public system alone or the private, which today is so big, and therefore the interaction between them would be what our systems analysis would be about. But we'd also look at specifically specific programs and their evaluation or evaluation of the services themselves to see the problem of coverage and why it is there. Once do we do an evaluation, we are looking at not only describing what is, but where is it working, what part of it is working, what part is not working, and therefore how to make those correctives inside. What are the correct, what is reaching people and what is not reaching people and why? And thereby, we see it as a two-end process, the system providing and the demand side and user side, and how do the two come together, or the mismatch and the gap between them. The health services designing would be the next step, having understood what the situation today is and the needs are. So health services designing 
and the final step of health policy formulation. And all these are not linear steps, they are all happening together and simultaneously, as you said, for epidemiological studies. And very often, policy formulation comes first and a lot of things fall in place afterwards. So, it is this kind of a mix that we see, but health systems research at all of these dimensions. This is the definition that is most accepted in the uh, dominant health systems research world today, which was uh, brought out in the Beijing Second Global Symposium on Health Systems Research in 2012. Health system research is a multidisciplinary field of health research, studies governance, financial and delivery arrangements for health care and public health services, implementation considerations for reforming or strengthening these arrangements, and broader economic, legal, political and social context in which these arrangements are negotiated. In the same level of economic development, but you can have very different policies, very different approaches as we can see across the globe. So, all these issues become completely central. The purpose of health system research is to improve the understanding and performance of health systems. Now, this health systems, therefore, I'll come back to again why I've italicized it. Health system research, therefore, includes all of health services research, most health policy research, and some clinical and population health, but does not include biomedical research. And therefore, that's we draw upon that and build into delivery systems. Now, therefore, what where, where translational, from? translational is again a product slurry. But policy is not part of translational. So, it is translating from the lab and the clinical into product production is translational. And that sort of would be one part that we look at when we do health systems. Yeah, but that is not classically that is not how it has happened and that is not how it has been in practice. Um, so, now uh, the WHO definition of a health system is really saying a health system consists of all organizations, people and actions whose primary intent is to promote, restore or maintain health. See, otherwise health system people are everybody, I am doing it for my health every day at home. I am doing it for my family and therefore, that is also to my mind part of the health system. But it is not my primary activity and therefore, this definition of WHO puts it at the health system is really the health service system. Now, there, there is a bit of a debate because if we want, what is the objective decides how you boundary your system. You know, if my purpose is rheumatic diseases, then my boundary would be rheumatic services and therefore, it would be or if it is TB, the TB program, right? And that would be the boundary of my system. Similarly, if I look at my objective being improving health of the population, then it cannot be the health service system alone as part of the system. We will have to widen it to much broader boundaries and it really becomes all kinds of societal systems from agriculture and food production to education to what have you. Right? But if we, if we keep it manageable to what WHO can do and what the Ministry of Health can do and therefore, we keep it as health service systems. But that to my mind is a epistemological reductionism right? and that is sort of part of our problem as well in the way we do health and health policy. Um, this now is showing you what the WHO's defining of that health service is broken up for study purposes into these six dimensions, which are classically called the six building blocks. And these are what every health systems person today swears by. So, service delivery, which requires the health workforce, information, the management information systems, the medical products, and there you will see vaccines being so prominently placed, financing, and leadership and governance models. Anything that you see missing here that you would, people, they just do not figure here. Right? So, it is a top down service approach that is clearly depicted in this and today they have come to realize that with a lot of discussion and critique being made. So, that is the seventh that they now add on, but it is a, it should be absolutely, I, I just come to exactly that point. Absolutely, yeah, because that anyway they have placed that service as the boundary. So, that intersectorality goes out. So, now therefore, I am saying that within health systems itself you can see there are different approaches. So, there is this positivist approach where methodologically it takes from the physics paradigm and therefore, objective universal quantitative science as its methodology with statistical modeling as the real way of, of any uh, systems analysis that has been done operational research and systems analysis and they draw from that. And that is a completely top down approach and it can, the assumption clearly is that modern medicine is the one we have to deliver. Universal health coverage of modern medicine is the assumption and there is no questioning of that assumption. 
the realist approach, which is an advance on this, coming in with social science approaches and talking about contextually, you will have to, it can't be universalized. It has to be, context, the health system has to be context specific. And therefore, you take local culture, local context into account. And also the perceptions of people along the line, from the policy maker to the providers, the doctor must understand the policy if it has to have been operationalized, down to the health worker in the field, and then to the community. So that's a realist approach, but it's still a top-down approach. And then there is the holist approach, which looks at all possible contextual factors, looks at intersectorality, looks at the history of development of health services, and therefore how we've got there, and the other side of the users and where they are, what is their own understanding, and what are their practices that already exist. And then what can we add on? What are the gaps there that can be added on, with whether of knowledge or of practice or of actual service delivery? Right? Now, this is what we would call a bottom-up approach, where you begin from that. And that's what Vedya uh, Shogi uh, was talking about. Um, so this, uh, but broadly within health systems research, uh, I won't go into the details of this, just to say these are kind of the steps and the approaches that one would adopt when we adopt a scientific approach to health systems research. And there are a whole set of things that we would be doing. But we would begin with marshalling the evidence of situation analysis, develop what are possible options, try them in the field, and then assess their final outcomes, and thereby then upscale or move into policy. Now, looking at it from a holistic approach, and I'll try and give some examples and move into this now, because that's where I'm sure all of us want to see us moving, that there's an environmental context that we'd have to consider. So the ecosystem, are we talking of the coastal area or the mountains? You'd have to have a difference, which in modern science, we were never really looking at it in that way. Uh, social determinants of health, the meaning systems. But that's something that's completely kept out, because there's no other meaning than what modern science and biomedicine gives you. There's no questioning of that. So the minute we put meaning systems into the context, then we're looking at cultural context, scientific paradigms, with epistemology being different. And therefore, what policy make frameworks can come from different epistemologies. The service system design, which has those six building blocks primarily coming in, a service system design, and people there, if we want, starting from them. Um, with the policy framework as it is, and what are existing services, and how do you modify or how do you move into that? Now, that's a whole big task which we would think, want to think about for today. Because the service system today is completely unsustainable in all kinds of ways. We've already heard about the iatrogenesis that it does in the US, where you find that a third cause of death is iatrogenic because of errors and so on. We heard that. We heard the costs which are becoming exorbitant even for the US and so on. So it's neither economically sustainable nor environmentally sustainable nor socially sustainable, the inequalities it creates and inaccess that are there. Therefore, what kind of system design and community and people's health seeking behavior relates to all the above. And I would say, as completely agree, this should be number one. But in the frame of things, this is where we are. Even in today, we put it in this whole frame. Now, I just want to acknowledge completely where I come from and the question that I'm constantly asked, why are you as a medical doctor thinking of all this? And how did you start thinking about it? At the end of my medical college period, I moved out wondering what my role now as an MBBS doctor was in my society. And I could see a whole lot of things. You know, a child coming into the pediatrics department, we give them a drip, send them back to the same slum. Now, what is it going to mean? I'll see the child, you know, and so on. So those were the questions with which I began my search. Looked first at various community health programs in rural areas. At that time, this is I'm talking of the early 80s. They were the community health worker programs. And that was the big model. And I went around several of the medical friends circle and other networks that worked on these and realized that they were also sort of at a dead end. The community health worker, what we see today as the ASHA or the Mitanin, are become part of the bottom end of that top-down health service system rather than becoming bottom up. So what are the answers to that? And I was searching for that. and. Fortunately, happened to reach JNU and a department with the founder of whom was Dr. President Deep Energy. And uh, I'd like to pay respects to him and Professor Mutatkar at that time. These one can see, identify as two people who brought to us the bottom-up approach in health systems in India, starting with the people's understanding and anthropological approaches. Professor Banerjee was a medical doctor who went on to do anthropology in Cornell after he had done a pioneering study with the National Tuberculosis Institute. And the TB program across the world was changed because of that study, Stig Anderson and 
Dr. Banerjee doing that together. Uh, so what I learned in my course, I joined the coursework there and then went on to a PhD there and then as faculty. Uh, what I learned from him was this bottom-up approach and that's what I've always tried to practice through. And that's why Ayush and local health traditions become so central to what our health system should be like. Now, one central idea that I find always very useful for health system, for defining health, holistic health systems is if you look at it as a cultural construct rather than looking at it as a technical or a technological issue. And according to the definition that he gave us, that health culture itself, the knowledge and the technology is part of that culture. Culture is not what, you know, people generally think of tribes have a culture and therefore tribal and primitive cultures are what are cultures and modern is not to be studied. According to him, he's putting these three in relational terms, he's saying so knowledge and technology of all system that's available, the service delivery system and the users and people and communities and their history and their culture, all these have to be seen in a relational way and each one is influenced by the other. The kind of even modern medicine practice in India is not the same that it's practiced in other countries and there are lots of studies showing us that. So there is that. And all these, when looked at holistically, is what is the holistic health service system. Now, since this has not come into popular theory of health systems research, and the popular dominant one today is of the positivist kind, and now the Nobel Prize of the Economic Development, RCT, is the thing that they've got it for, and RCT is classically in that mood, into health systems. Exactly, and they're now they're bringing it into field studies of a very complex kind, where you're trying to put these three thing complexities together. Right? So uh, I just want to uh, give an example of a study that I tried to do then when I was at the National Health Systems Resource Center, which was the technical body created for the National Rural Health Mission by the ministry. And I was there as advisor public health planning in 2008-9. So those were initial years and they were very exciting years because the rural health mission was just getting off. And uh, when I asked for data, for, because the rural health mission in its mandate had this strategy of mainstreaming of Ayush and revitalizing local health traditions. So when I had to choose my sort of areas of work, this was one I clearly chose, and asked the, the Department of, health of Ayush at that time to give whatever data they have on usage, on this. there was absolutely no data, because nobody was looking at it from a health systems lens. And they were really looking at very little, so, but health systems was something they were certainly not looking at. So there was no data on how many users, users for what, none of that was available. So we did a study, and th that was one uh, purpose. But I went to that because the administrators who were administering the rural health mission constantly kept saying in the meetings, oh, this agenda of Ayush is a political issue. There is really no demand for it. So why are we being, you know, don't put too much of your energies into this kind of thing. And these were people who I thought were otherwise sensitive administrators. And therefore said, okay, let me get real data and it will be a reality check for myself. Am I just being too romantic about all this? Hmm? So uh, therefore this study was done. And uh, as I said, oh, this is the study that finally got published on that and it's available online. I think it's also in the facts that's there. Now, uh, objective of the study that we placed there, now NRHM was the only mandate that we had as being in that NHSRC. So I just expanded it to say, in the context of existing IU services and LHT and added on also what people's perspectives were. Pre the present demand for IU services and LHT, because that's what the administrators needed. Access to IU services and local health traditions is co-location improving coverage, right? Because that was the big strategy of NRHM. Place IU doctors in uh, PHC upwards. Quality of services as assessed by public health management criteria by Ayush criteria and by the demand of services, meaning user's assessment of quality. How would I see it from these three different criteria? So I thought there would be different epistemological bases for each of these. And the potential role of Ayush and LHT in architectural, NRHM kept using this term, we are doing architectural correction. And what they saw as architectural correction was really financial architectural connection and management structures correction to make it more efficient. But this knowledge correction was something, so I wanted to add that on and therefore added it to this thing of saying architectural <laughs> correction. Uh, with decentralization and context specific flexibility, is it actually, what is the potential, bring that out after the data is there, to say therefore what potential can be feed into the system. 
Uh, I won't go into this. This is the study design telling us the details with which we did it with, across 18 states. I'll move on faster. And this, again, just to give you the numbers kind of thing of 266 18 states is what we covered. And at the simultaneously, we didn't take some states because Mass with Professor Mutatkar was already doing a four state study, and another one was doing Rajasthan. So we left out these states right? and uh, went into these. But as you can see from institutions, two focus group discussions and household data at village level. This was all covered uh, in the study. Uh, and we, to analyze the data, while we had that data of you know, how many doctors, who's using what, all that, I won't go into that at all. Uh, but just to say that some things that we had to innovate by methodology. For example, the quality criteria. So we used, I'm just showing the tables uh, of how we constructed it. it the standard uh, quality criteria for modern medicine is infrastructure, the human resources, the drug availability, the record keeping, and so on. Now, we added on at least some more, but not enough to my mind in that from the other side. But what I had at one point done for a discussion where we had P. Ram Manohar from AVP, a research body, give us an article and come and present it on how does Ayurveda look at quality of care. And he gave us at least those four where he said that it has to be the doctor, the nursing person, the drugs, and the patient. And these four, and these don't figure here at all. So, um, and then what happened in the co-located facilities and the standalone. And we actually found standalone quality was better than the co-located facility in terms of the services. The second thing we did was, since from the households, we had uh, done two things. One, our social science methodology, which all studies uh, showed, uh, you, know, you look at NFHS, which is the big data, macro data set for health seeking behavior. It showed you that use for diarrheal disease in children, two to 8% people use Ayush. But that's unbelievable. Right? By any stretch of mind, if we know our society, and if we've seen any anthropological studies, for diarrheal disease in children, it's not 2 to 8% of households which use this. Therefore, there was a methodological problem in the way they do their questionnaire. And what we started off by doing was you know, priming people to, to showing we are not only value neutral, that we value their knowledge of traditional plants and foods as medicinal. And gather that first. And then our subsequent questions, and we actually got about 90% usage and so on. So there was a complete shift in the data from this. But what we also did was now, once we had a list of what plants and foods they considered remedies, how do we validate them? Because everybody's saying, you know, now people's knowledge is all got vitiated, it's all you know, anecdotal and so on. What are you saying? So we got CCRAS, uh, the Siddha Council, and Unani Council to look at in the areas where these were dominant systems, to look at people's lists and validate them. And we created a system for that, sitting with the CCRS group and Dr. Srikant and others, uh, and developed this methodology, which I'm happy to say now the CCRS and ministry actually use in their studies and what they ask projects to do. In terms of using it, you know, first the classical documents, but if you don't have it in classical, then use it in others, and this V1, V2 kind of <laughs> categorization. So uh, this came about because of the collaborative nature of work that we were able to do, and we do it separately for Unani and homeopathy. Uh, just a bullet points of some of the major findings to show what kind of thing the health system research brought out. This is broadly saying that the demand of Ayush services able to was very high. And where was it high? Co-location uh, co had increased coverage, but not necessarily utilization. Utilization was high wherever quality services were being provided. Because people will use services when they are quality and not use them. We know they move from public to private also because of that idea. And where was this, therefore? The most dark thing which hit everybody in the ministry was Tamil Nadu had the highest utilization of Siddha. And in the same institution, their PHC, their hospital, are the best public health modern systems across the country. And that's where at least one third of patients, by choice, go to the Siddha. So that hit everybody. And gladly, we also heard that in the next discussions in the steering committee for the 12th plan, people were carrying this book with them in their hands. So as a researcher, that was sort of a great satisfaction that there was movement happening there. It also showed us other things. I won't go too much into that. But something that we looked at, for example, the governance systems, they are different across states. Somewhere there's a directorate, somewhere there's a commissionerate, some, et cetera, et cetera. And it made a difference to the way the systems were rolled out. It also showed us that the states that had taken up more seriously, there was a cultural and political difference in the states and the state governments. And therefore, there was this happening. And the kind of difference it showed us was that the, the problems of governance in the NRHM was that there was no clear mandate for Ayush doctors. So many states were not giving Ayush 
drugs at all and they are there to substitute for modern doctors and provide modern medicine and that is how now we are building bridge courses and we are doing all of that in that same vein. Uh, the HMIS for IU, so as in Maharashtra, I am sure all of you know, many of the PhDs are manned by Ayurvedic BMS doctors, but not. Can I just take two minutes and finish up? Hmm? So, this is kind, the kind of studies, that, the results that came, which were very beneficial. This one showing that they came all 40 percent for acute conditions were coming to Ayush in these institutions. Hmm? So, I will leave out the rest of the the and just come to this and thereby I hope uh, what I have been able to argue is that we need to come to a holistic health systems approach. For that we need a lot of help from the Ayurveda community to be able to pitch in not only the data of it, but the epistemological base in which how do we look at systems like this. There is a different epistemology and can that come into, it can clearly come into standards, quality criteria and so on, but also into how do you look at systems itself, there could be differences. So, I think there is a lot of interaction that one would be happy to do. We are already doing it with TDU and we would be very happy if others also pitch in and, uh, and certainly we can see that it is not only India, it is the world that needs that kind of a change in health systems thinking. Thank you. We had the data of 23 states, which has been, of course, published in Ayush in publication two uh, books. The Ayush secretary, lady secretary, was telling us that when she went to the planning commission to ask for funds, as in those days, you know, everybody had to go to planning commission for funds. The planning commission asked us, what is the utilization of Ayush? You first defend that, and then only we can see the work. Now, how do you do that? So, she actually, besides that, she wanted us to do a big survey and was giving us a huge amount of money for that. But then her term was over and another secretary came and he gave it to NSSO. And the stupid NSSO asked the stupid questions that the, 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 the generalization they came in the media was that majority of Indian people are using allopathic medicine. Now, we have, we have launched, yet this is what has come. We, we launched this one study. Lady doctors of all systems of medicine, when they become mothers themselves, what do they do? Then in Pune itself, we have a Yunani uh, store, you know, I mean a shop in cantonment, which is more than 100 year old. And we had so many Ayurvedic shops, more than 100 year old. Are they are not running in losses. Who are going to the people who are using it? I mean, this is just, you know, this is the way. The, if, if, we are, if I ask you, do you follow Ayurveda Yunani or Sydney? No, but if you have come, what do you do? I mean, it's a methodological question, no? <laughs> but the NSS was done. Uh, moving on to the next, uh, we are short of time. And uh, Dr. Nagarkar will also not present uh, her talk. So we uh, have uh, Dr. Ashok Vaidya, please, to present the slides from uh, Dr. Rama Vaidya, ma'am. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist, and she's uh, done her PhD in applied biology and Ford, uh, Ford Foundation fellow. Uh, she is going to, her slides are going to be on pharmacoepidemiology and the term she coined. Uh, sir has been very kind to present uh, on her behalf uh, since she is unable to be with us today. Uh, please, sir. I am pushed into this by Girish and my wife both. <laughs> Girish was supposed to present this. So basically, <coughs> the theme of the talk today, session today is epistemology for epidemiology. So, she fundamentally, she started the first presentation, Bhushan and myself, her head, on the concept of Ayurvedic pharmacoepidemiology. So, she felt that where do we stand? Because uh, Dr. Chopra has been asked by the <coughs> institute, but we have not been contacted at all because she said initially we will take up Ayurvedic pharmacoepidemiology. So, it is worth checking her slides. So, these are the people who started it. The first paper was by Girish, myself, Bhushan, Rama as the first author of Ayurvedic Pharmacoepidemiology. And Nutan is now finishing her PhD. Girish Tillu has finished her PhD guide, Dr. Rama Vidya and Bhushan. And all others are also involved very actively in this as opinion leaders. Now, Ayurvedic Pharmacoepidemiology itself requires a paradigm shift. 
because we can't apply the classical pharmacopneumology to Ayurvedic pharmacopneumology. It's a need of different focus than pharmacovigilance. Lot of money has been wasted in pharmacovigilance by WHO in India, ICMR, as well as Ayush. Because nobody likes to report a, a, a side effect or adverse effect readily. So, pharmacopneumology is a study of utilization effects of drugs in clinical and population settings and the outcome of drug therapy. Whereas, pharmacogenic is primarily drug safety studies, collection, detection of ADRs. As a consequence, this has been a mismatch in India because pharmacovigilance was needed for new chemical entities which are entering therapeutics. Whereas, Ayurveda was ages old remedies, partly modified, differently formulated, being used. So, research in Ayurvedic pharmacology is sporadic, preliminary, and a very few centers in India. Only our center, Kasturba Society, and also Pune University have only engaged in this pharmacoepidemiology. Because there are divergent approaches, and it was stated by Yoel Coste that pharmacopoeia's drug safety was published online in Wiley recently. And these papers show that distinguished pharmacovigilance. Pharmacovigilance has failed all over the world. So, we need pharmacoepidemiology as an approach, as a, as a set or subset of Ayurvedic epidemiology. And epistemologically, Ayurvedic epidemiology also involves in terms of pathogenesis. Because we have not given serious thought of pathogenesis, because epidemiology started with pathogenesis. One index case of mal, uh, cholera, we know the rest of the story. So, there can be one index case of malignancy established metastasis completely disappearing, living for 10 years. It is like that detection of cholera. So, it is very essential that we distinguish this in terms of Sanchaya, Prakopa, Prasara and sthana samshray, that is some shat kriya kal. You can have epidemiology of shat kriya kal also. So, pharmacogenesis in Ayurveda is, is an emerging scenario and uh, there are only recently some papers by Chaudhary and some Sanjeev was primarily at BHU focused on that. It requires a very different kind of approach because in epidemiology, classical epidemiology, you have what you call as confounding variables. So, you expect the controlled group and other group to have confounding variables. In Ayurvedic therapeutic is not drug, drug epidemiology, it is the therapeutic epidemiology. So, there are determinate variables. We know in which ritu, which drug would work better, whether it is given morning better with what diet, what anupan. So, it is a highly complex thing that we have not even given due thought to it. So, these are only few papers which have come, but it is worth reading them because for the students and the all slides will be available to you. It's, if anyone wants to start, it is a very good area to do even MD dissertation or even PhD. I am not going to into the detail, but Ayush and even Shailaja started, how all of you are drawn in, I know, and all this huge state experience you have. Ultimately, I ask only one question to Dr. Mutatkar or Ritupriya. Have you found one thing which leads to a major drug discovery or major therapeutic discovery out of this service? One. So, what I want the students to realize that Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia is a discipline for new discoveries, not described in text also. And that is the greatest challenge that we should really rather than pharmacovigilance and all these surveys. So, she asked a question of why and, and what 5 W's and 1 H how and this was all stated, he asked all the, she asked all the opinion leaders about this. And obviously, there are many ways people look at only safety, some look at activity, some look at what even marketed formulation, Dr. Nutan has a publication on marketed Ayurvedic formulations. 
and it is amazing how the labeling kind of what kind of nonsense is going on in, in the labeling itself. So, it is a huge subject by itself. So, who should undertake study? Again, it is a debate, but I believe that epidemiology statisticians are needed, but very essential is team of wage scientists, because they only know both the streams and can, can identify what is to be done. But the team can be truly meet for what they call pre-project or pre-program workshops. Many of our surveys then are decided before even involving all the stakeholders, particularly the people. So, it is very vital that who should do, we should have people participation. Where it is to be done? I think anywhere where Ayurvedic therapy is being used is a site to be done. But digitized databases, I think, Rutupiya, that is the main thing of Ayush which is needed. Now, at Sion Ayurvedic College, all data are digitized, right from the time the patient enters up to the leaves, everything digitized. So, we are going to engage there in that large data to start understand first study what is happening in the field. We must be field biologists first. Molecular and experimental biology have made us forget that ultimately all things happened in field biology. And what to be done? There can be drug utilization study, market study, there can be also single case study, cap surveys, attitude, a huge number. This slide you are going to have, so I am not going to each because of time constraint. But I think that it is very vital that you should take up what interests you. Do not take up only something which is not a pure passion. So, if your passion is that I am interested primarily in case record analysis, do it. People decry anecdotes. Anecdotes have been the greatest beginning of most major biological and clinical discoveries. We should not forget them. At the same time, there are lousy case records which are just me too case records. So, we must distinguish between this, but follow your passion that I am more of a public person like Lok Ar Arvind Chopra said that I would like to work with community, then do that. Now, you, I would like to work in a hospital setting, do that. I would like to work with a Vedya's practice, do that. So, when earlier the better, now already it is too late. Rama Madam published this about 12 years back or something almost, the first paper and hardly pharma, everywhere pharmacovigilance came up. Pharmacopoeia was not mentioned. We approached even our uh, institute where you were director for Siddha Pharmacopoeia and it did not didn't, uh, didn't click at all. So, there, there is any new paradigm will always be rejected. So, if you are rejected, you should be happy. Yes. So, Dr. Nutan Nabar, who is getting her PhD within three months now, she can really interact with the group. And how to be done, I think is not yet to be decided. We should have truly, whether it can be done, how it can be done, because to do India anything, you saw Dr. Chopra's work, it is never easy. All of us who have started from scratch anything, it takes a lot of time. Lastly, this is my summary, I am not going to read it, but this is also with you where I have tried to summarize what I feel in my experience of 50 years of drug and therapeutics, when it should be done, how it should be done, who should do it and, and also what should be done. I would say what I would like to focus because that is very important. I have five minutes or just I, I end with this. So, what determination of usage frequency is very important. What plants and formulations are most used? Then you say 100 most used, take them up, follow up for next next 2, 3, 5 years, long term, 1 year, 2 year and just, just document the effects. And lastly, linkages with observation studies and reverse pharmacology for new drug development. Thank you. Well, we have a couple of minutes to summarize and wind up. Uh, I must thank Dr. Arati to agree not to speak today. And the same I am doing, I am not going to speak 
and present my slides and so on and so forth. Because I am told by the organizers that we are supposed to close by 1.30. Perhaps we are going to cross by about a couple of minutes, not more than that. We had four presentations today. Dr. Chopra told us about community and the importance of the community and how you work with them. I will just tell you a couple of stories about my own experience with the community. And this is with respect to smallpox first, followed by leprosy. In smallpox, I uh, worked in Buradabad for smallpox eradication somewhere in 1975-76. One of the villages where I went to, Kart is the primary health center and nearby area in Muradabad district. Went to a village because what we were doing, I was the WHO epidemiologist those days. What we did was, we were trying to identify cases of smallpox and then try to find that people in that village starting from the household going around like ring vaccination and cover the entire population of the nearby areas. Now this was the thing that we were supposed to do and we were spreading the message about what to do, what not to do and so on. I found one place where nobody was permitting us to go inside, one household. And in that household there was a fire outside kept, there were some neem, neem leaves hanging on the door and they were saying that you are not going we are not going to permit you. I said, well, I will have to go inside and see the patient to start my activities. If it is a case of smallpox, I need to see that. Very reluctantly, they permitted me. One old lady took me inside, closed the door immediately, and she started walking upstairs on a very narrow staircase. She went in, went up, opened a door, and then went inside. Everything was very dark. I never knew what to do. Then she opened the window. And she called me and said, you can now walk up. So I went up over there, peep through this thing, and see what you can see as far as the patient is concerned. So I saw clinical picture was a very obvious smallpox. You can't hide. I saw that I came out and started my routine activities, which were supposed to be telling these people what to do, what not to do. And then vaccinating all these people around. After finishing all that work, when I was on my way out of the village, the paramedic who was helping me in all activities, he said, well, that lady is the bahu of that household. Will you like to talk to her also? I said, yes, certainly. So I told her again the same story repeated. She was wearing a hungat. She never opened that uh, thing and looking down still told me or Mali, Hamare Mali ne bhi yahi kaha tha. What you are telling us was told to us by our gardener also. Us gardener is supposed to take care of the smallpox cases and they were doing all these things. So that means you are keeping the smallpox case inside, trying to see that spreading is not occurring. But the thing that happened subsequently was, after the death of that patient, they will take the patient outside and then whole village will come around and will get exposed. In the process, they will catch smallpox also. Same thing was happening with Ebola also. Now this was one lesson I learned while talking to people, while understanding their philosophy, how they do the work, culture. When we are working in leprosy vaccine trial near about Walajabad, we found that our teams were prevented from entering the village. There are some people who were spreading some messages, wrong messages, that something is very, very wrong. And they said, well, if the vaccine is producing all these things, these people should not enter the village. And they should be stopped from working and not doing anything as far as this vaccination is concerned. So I said, let my teams come back. Then I went inside. First of all, talked to the collector, told him that well, we are not going to create any law and order situation, but we'll start spreading our messages to the people, talk to them, identify what's going wrong, why it is going wrong, and what to do about it. He agreed. He said, as far as you are sure that you are not going to create any law and order problem, I have no problem, you go ahead. 
I was going alone with my driver and people were wondering how this fellow who does not know Tamil can go around and meet these people and understand what is going on. So they were asking me, are you not afraid? I said, well, these are the people with whom I am working, for whom I am working. They have seen me. Why should I be worried? Why should I be afraid? So I, go, I was going around talking to them, understanding what is going wrong. Then we started organizing our teams and some community meetings also. In one of the meetings, one lady started speaking that, well, if I stop this program, none of you will be getting a vaccine against leprosy. My own son received polio vaccine, suffered from polio. Do you mean to say that I should stop polio immunization? I am not going to do that. Let this program go ahead. So all this kind of enthusiasm we are able to get from the people, making use of that, we went wrong. So that is the way the things happen. Yeah, all, all those kinds of things. In fact, one of the com committee members or ethics committee, was that is one area we have to know a lot about. Was whatever that we do in epidemiology, in science, in medicine, in Ayurveda, if you are not following ethics pro uh, uh, principles, you are doing something grossly wrong. So our committee members were actually visiting the villages where the program was going on. Not only that, they administered a questionnaire and collecting that data, they have written papers as well. So that is the kind of thing our ethics committee members have done. One of the members, D.K. Sampath is the name. He was advocate, he is no more now. But he used to call me as his friend. I was hardly 30 years old and he was already 75 plus. So he came with me to a village and he found some ladies were gossiping, talking. So he went over there and tried to find out what is going on. He came back and said, well, we go back. I said, something has gone <laughs> grossly wrong. What is the problem? I, I could not argue with him in the village. So I got in the jeep and then I asked him, sir, what, what has happened? Are you not uh, happy about the work that was going on? He said, no. No, nothing of that kind. I went to that group of ladies and I found that they were not allowing one girl to go for immunization. This girl was pregnant and was not married, but people knew about it. And they said, this vaccine is not, not supposed to be given to pregnant ladies. So you should not get this vaccine, please go. Now, when I saw that your message has reached these people to that level, why should I worry about it? I know what you are doing is correct, what you are doing is right, and we are going back. That is it. So that is how the things go, and unless you meet with people, unless you are with the people, that is what when Madam you are saying, what is missing over there is the people. And if you do not take that into account, if they are not your partners, you just can't do anything. Thank you very much. May I now request uh, Dr. Gupta sir to please facilitate uh, Dr. Chopra for his, uh, for his time and for his fantastic presentation to us. And Dr. Unnikrishnan, please. Thank you very much for your talk and for your insights from Kerala. And ma'am, Dr. Ritu Priya for your talk on health systems. And May I now request uh, Dr. Angeline Jai Kumar to please facilitate our chair for this session. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for chairing this session and for bringing your uh, such a long experience, over three decades of experience in community and in epidemiology.